Gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of theater, music, art, literature, social justice, politics, and tonight, film. I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's conversation, our first of 2019, with the multi-talented and award-winning actor, screenwriter, and director, John Krasinski. He's currently winning acclaim for A Quiet Place, the post-apocalyptic horror movie about a family besieged by sound-seeking monsters, which he directed, co-wrote, and starred in. Moderating tonight's event is New York Times-style reporter Stephen Kuritz. Just a few of his recent memorable articles include a profile of Ralph Lauren's Barber, an in-depth exploration of the latest rage in fashion photo shoots, The Laundromat, and one man's year-long quest to have yarn-dyed flannel made in America once again. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Stephen Kuritz, and our special guest, John Krasinski. going to phone it in. Soak it in. I am not phoning it in now. Hey, everybody. Hi. Yes. That's all I needed. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, John and I will talk about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll take questions from well, the I'm audience. I'm not going to make it that long, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, John, your film, A Quiet Place, uh, which you directed, co-wrote, and co-star in, um, has made $340 million worldwide. It has a 95% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, and it's a likely Oscar contender. Um, in other words, it's earned money, critical acclaim, and prestige. Um, you know, None of what you just said made sense. <laughs> I, just, I just blacked out yeah, most and of that. An out-of-body so. <laughs> yeah. experience. Um, what were your expectations for the film? Was this, uh, did it go exactly as you planned? <laughs> Can you imagine if I said yes? <laughs> What a jerk thing that would be like. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, no, I mean, my expectations were pretty, not, pretty non-existent. For me, um, they were much more personal. This was an, a, a huge swing for me in my career. Um, as a director, taking a big chance, doing my first studio movie, um, working with my wife, things like that that were so personal to me that that's what I was focused on. I was actually focused on doing the best movie I could for her, if I'm honest. I wanted to make sure that I took care of her the way I would hope every other director took care of her and made a movie that was worthy of her. And so it was that kind of deal for me. And then we made this small little movie and I remember leaving set on the last day and saying to Emily, I was like, I think it's pretty cool. I think we have like a special little movie. And she's like, yeah, maybe we'll get like five high fives from some of our friends. <laughs> it turns out we had a lot more friends than we, than we thought, so yeah. Um, you know, the film came out in April, having had time to digest it. Um, two questions. One, why do you think A Quiet Place resonated with audiences? And then, you know, having been in the film industry for a while now, what have you learned about how to predict a film's um, chances before it comes out? I mean, is there any kind of science to it at all? I definitely learned the number one thing, which is predict nothing. I mean, uh, you, you can't predict anything. I don't think anybody at Paramount or otherwise would have predicted the success of this movie. And I have been in other movies where they predicted only success and it was the complete opposite. So I think that that's something to be, it's bizarrely comforting. I think that there's something about just doing the work and allowing everybody else to decide what they think of that work and how it relates to them. So definitely not, I will not predict anything going forward. Even with this success, it's one of those things where you get to the pinnacle. I was actually just reading that Paul Schrader after they said after writing Taxi Driver, what did it feel like? Were you always trying to get back there? And he said, no, because I was one of the most lucky people in the business to be 
told that I had what it took to do something that good, and I feel the exact same way. And so once you have something like this, you just feel lucky to have it and keep going forward. Um, and then as far as, uh, what was the other question? Why do you think it resonated? Well, you know, why it resonated, I, I hope, uh, I, I always hope that it resonated for the same reason that it resonated with me. This is not, in my opinion, a horror movie. This is a movie that is a family drama. It's a movie about parenthood. It's a movie about your family and what it takes to, what would you do for those people, what real dedication looks like, what real love looks like. And it's sort of this family drama Trojan horse as a horror movie, which I really loved. And that was my whole intention in doing the rewrite of the movie, was really making this about family. And as bizarre as it looks when you look at the poster of uh, the movie, this is a love letter to my kids. I, uh, I genuinely sat down, uh, when I read the spec script, the idea was perfect, but there was so much I wanted to do with it because we had just had our second daughter, she was three weeks old, so I was holding a tiny human being while reading about a family, what would they do to protect their kids, and I just knew that that was the metaphor I wanted to, to go further with. So for me, this is the most personal movie uh, I have ever done and, and probably will ever do. Mm. Um, I think people were surprised that you directed uh, a horror movie. How dare you? Um, <laughs> 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 um, uh, <laughs> are you a fan of the horror genre? I am now. <laughs> um, yeah, right. right. I, uh, <laughs> I would have categorized myself as a scaredy cat or um, I mean, I, I couldn't watch horror movies at all, let alone make one. I am a product of the early 90s where I was at some sleepover and watched Nightmare on Elm Street and blacked out for six years. <laughs> um, so I remember really listening to that 12-year-old self or 10-year-old self or however old I was saying, well, we'll never do that again. It was really a knee-jerk reaction. And so I think certainly in preparing to direct this movie, I watched everything. And what I learned really quickly, the first thing I learned was how ignorant I was to be not watching genre this whole time. Because certainly in the last five or 10 years, in my opinion, some of the best storytellers, some of the greatest directors, cinematographers, uh, the, the, the best movies are in the genre space, whether it be Get Out, whether it be The Witch. One of my favorite movies of all time is Let the Right One In, the original version, which totally ruined me as a love story. It's such a beautiful love story. and so. I started to see that genre is actually this incredible um, sort of access point for people, if that makes any sense. I remember I was talking to uh, Drew Goddard, a good friend of mine, who wrote Cabin in the Woods, and he just uh, wrote and directed um, Bad Times at the El Royale. Go see it. It's amazing. Um, but one of the things he said, because I had never done genre, he said, you know, what's really funny about genre for me is it keeps, you, it keeps the audience at an arm's length from the movie in a very good way. And what he meant by that was, if you're a child of divorce, maybe watching Kramer versus Kramer is too intense. It's too in your face and, and something that you might have a hard time digesting. Whereas if you watch E.T., which is also a movie about uh, a kid going through a, a family divorce, you're able to access it more. You're able to, because it's an alien, because it's a little boy befriending an alien, you allow yourself to be a little bit more vulnerable in those spaces and really kind of delve into these bigger ideas through genre. And I thought that was one of the most astute things I'd ever uh, been told. I think that was really brilliant, and, and certainly that's how I feel about this movie. This movie is, is, is allowing you to access, like I said, the bigger uh, picture of parenthood. And did you, um, how did you prep, or how do you prep um, when you know, this is, you directed a few other movies before this, I've heard some directors say that they watch the same movie, same iconic movie, mm -hmm. um, over and over each time before uh, they direct something. What was your process? You, you got the script, you know you're gonna be doing this, then what, what happened? Well, there, I mean, there's a lot of prep specifically, but as far as like getting in the mindset for me, there was, absolutely, it, to me it was about, first of all, doing my homework, like I said, watching a lot of horror movies, but then choosing what this movie was to me. And this movie to me felt more like uh, a Western. It felt more like um, a real throwback movie. I wanted it to feel like a throwback movie rather than a very modern horror. So um, the, as far as what kind of movie I wanted to make, the, the touchstone, without a doubt, was Jaws, Alien, um, and uh, uh, all of Hitchcock stuff. Um, as far as tone of the movie and what I wanted it to look like and feel like, again, I went through the, the westerns, and there's some searchers in there, but one of the things that I really came to, to realize, a lot of people came up and said, did you watch a lot of silent movies? And I said, I actually did watch a lot of silent movies, but the thing about silent movies is they're actually devoid of sound. They can't have sound whether they like it or not. 
So I started watching more modern uh, filmmakers who dealt with silence and sound or lack thereof in, in a more uh, recent way. So for me, the two movies that I kept coming back to were um, There Will Be Blood by Paul Thomas Anderson. So that first 12 or 14 minute segment is no words. And I think that that was so beautiful because the world around him is very loud and there's a lot of things happening, but he's not speaking. And then the other one was No Country for Old Men by the Coen brothers. So, you know, uh, uh, Josh Brolin's character is, is without words for most of the movie, um, not only because he's a quiet guy, but because he's often on his own sort of investigating these things. And so um, from, a, from a film standpoint, those were the two we watched. And also the reason why we demanded to shoot the movie on film. We wanted something to be in that first frame that you'd feel um, nostalgic, that you'd, be, you'd feel that you were sort of anytime, anywhere, USA. Hmm. Um, can we show a clip? From the movie? No, you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's totally fine. The kid's, <laughs> the kid's fine. If you haven't seen the movie, he's fine. <laughs> Don't go see it. Um, no, what's funny about that scene is, so I was writing um, all the time while Emily was in London. I was in London with her and the kids. Uh, she was shooting a little indie movie called Mary Poppins. And <laughs> I really wanted to support her. Um, so I was, she was coming home and that scene in particular, I remember because when I wrote that scene, that was the first thing I did was go back to the beginning. I have to write everything pretty much sequentially. And um, she was like, we did this amazing thing where I floated down from the air and was holding an umbrella. And I was like, that's amazing. I killed a kid on page 10. <laughs> what? Very different days. Very, the dark and the light. Uh, you had mentioned Jaws and that, that scene reminds me and like the first, um, half hour of the film reminded me a lot of Jaws because the tension comes from what's lurking off screen. Um, in, the, in the first um, 40 minutes of the film, the monsters appear only uh, well, twice, if, you, if you've seen it, um, and very briefly, uh, like in that clip. Um, how did you decide the degree to which the audience would see the monsters? Sometimes, you know, with CGI, it can be cool or it, it can get really lame. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how did you... No, it's a, it, I mean, certainly the Jaws was the, the roadmap there. I mean, you know, I had, I'm a Jaws nerd, so I had, you know, read the book, The Jaws Log. If you haven't read it, it's great. Um, and I had seen all the documentaries on it, and it, it certainly is that thing where they all say that they got lucky. The, the shark was supposed to be in the movie way more. I'm sure you guys all know that. And um, the robot shark kept breaking, and that's why they never showed the shark in Jaws. And you see how powerful it is. So certainly that was the roadmap. But because I hadn't seen horror, it was weird because I got to be my own test case. I, you know, very similarly, it sounds cheesy, but very, very similarly to the little girl in the movie, what I thought of was my greatest weakness actually ended up being my greatest strength, meaning I went and watched all these horror movies and kept a little notebook right next to me. And I wasn't looking for anybody's techniques or anything like that. I was actually looking to see when I was scared. So I would write down every time I got scared or when I got nervous, and it was always the tension beats of the things that were yet to come, rather than when they did pop out of a closet or you know, when, when someone was killed or bitten or something like that. It was really always like just, relief. yeah, it's, right. it, the release is weirdly helpful in a way. You're like, oh, thank God that's over, even though that person's dead. Um, <laughs> right. But the buildup is what was so scary to me, and the idea of these characters being inseparable and so I just wrote the movie and then shot the movie thinking, all right, well, if I'm honest and true to what would scare me, hopefully other people would feel the same way. Mm. Um, I read that you, you didn't like how the monsters originally looked. Is that right? Or, uh, Not these that? creatures. Okay. So uh, again, Drew Goddard, one of the best bits of advice he gave me other than that amazing genre bit was um, start working on your creature right now because it'll never be your first, second, or third creature. It'll be like your 18th 
rendition of your creature. And he was, I think he might be right on. I think it was our 17th or 18th version of the creature. And what I mean by that is when we, were, when we started shooting, I had had drawings and these notebooks and things that I thought I wanted him to look like, uh, or her or it. Um, and they looked a certain way, and we sort of proceeded uh, shooting as if he, he or she looked this way. And it just, when I got into the edit, it was one of those weird things, and I'd never done visual effects, so I can't claim like some of these other directors of you know knowing exactly to see the creatures. But I did get a sense that it just wasn't going to feel as scary. I, once watching the film all put together, you actually see how much tension we had. And I didn't want this creature that was so dynamic. It looked a lot, it was a lot bigger. It had a lot more going on, a lot more bells and whistles. And I thought the scariest thing would be to have so few bells and whistles. And so that when it comes out, it's just the silhouette that scares you before you even know what it can do. Mm -hmm. And so then I went to ILM, and ILM, for those of you who don't know, is the visual effects house that in San Francisco they do, again, more indies like Star Wars and um, <laughs> Jurassic Park. So we had them come on to our movie, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life because, I, again, I was such a huge nerd for all those movies. And this guy, Scott Farrar, comes to set, and he was supposed to be there just to consult. Now, Scott's one of the original four or five guys at ILM. How that's annoying is when you're... <laughs> When you're at lunch telling stories about old experiences, and he goes, oh yeah, that's kind of like when I was holding the camera when the first Imperial ship flew over in the opening of Star Wars, and you're like, what? <laughs> and then he said, uh, yeah, when we were shooting the raptor scene in Jurassic Park, you know, getting those raptors right, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> you created the raptors? So he was there for 24 hours, 48 hours, just talking to us about logistics of how we would get the film to ILM and things like that. And he said, how are you feeling about all this? And I said, I'm going to be really honest with you. One of the best bits of advice my dad ever gave me was, um, I don't know is one of the strongest things you can say. And so I said, I, I have a lot of ideas. I know what I want to do, but I don't know what I'm doing. So can you just walk me through it for the next couple of days? I, I just want to talk it through. And after that 48-hour period, he called ILM and said, don't send anyone else. I'm going to stay. So one of the original guys at ILM decided to stay. And the reason he did is he said, this is reminding me exactly why I got in the business. Those early days with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas where these, these guys had a hunger and an imagination, and I was like, none of that is me, but <laughs> thank you for uh, categorizing me as that. It was one of those things where it was a collaboration from the beginning to the point where he would have me walk across the floor. Or he said, how do you see this guy walking? And you know, show me these drawings, and show me this, show me that. And it was, it was a collaboration back and forth, and so the guy you see in the movie um, is sort of an amalgam of all these different conversations that we had where he grew and changed. And then in the edit, there was this day where we were Skyping with ILM, and I said, I, I have to change the creature. And I weirdly saw S Scott smile. I knew he knew where I was going. And we did uh, uh, an about face very late in the game. And, you know, it's all adjustments from what we had before, but, but this, this thing is, is my favorite for sure. Um. You know, I iconic horror films often have a, a central metaphor. Um, think of the, the Shining, alcoholism, and Rosemary's Baby, about the anxiety of, of, of impending parenthood. You mentioned the metaphor of, of parenthood for this film. Would you just talk a little bit more about that? What is the movie saying about parenthood? That yeah. The kids should be quiet or? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Learn your place. Um, <laughs> No, again, I, I'm, I'm the father of two young little girls, and all the cliches are true. I mean, from the moment they came out, the color in the world changed, and you, you protect not only them, you protect the, the experience that you've been given the responsibility to have, um, that ability to interface with these people that are making you better every single second of the day. It, it starts to have these concentric circles where they change your life in the biggest ways, and so for me, Family has always meant everything. Family's been everything to me from, from a long ways back. I was lucky enough to have a fantastic upbringing. So um, I think in some of my movies, you know, certainly the hollers, there's a feeling of, of family there. Um, but this one was very personal. Like I said, we had just had our second daughter when I started rewriting it. And I think shooting it as well, certainly acting through it. Um, I remember Emily said, this is the hardest role she's ever done. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, because you know, to be quite honest, everything else is, you know, you're, you're pretending professionally. But this one, I'm not pretending anymore. This is actually my greatest and deepest fear. Not that creatures would come out of the woods and, <laughs> and kill our kids. Um, but it was more, and she, she nailed it in one line. She said, 
uh, my biggest fear is that I won't be there for them in that moment. Whatever that moment is, if I'm not there, it'll break my heart. And, and, and that, that really nailed it for me, whether it's, you know, for us, first day of preschool or later on, first boyfriend, first day of college, it's like when, if you're not there for that moment, where your kids are scared, you know, that's what we were working on the whole time. Um, I mean, it's a family movie also in the sense that, you know, you're starring with and you're directing your wife. Um, can we show a clip um, of, um, uh, that features Emily? Please. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite movies in the, uh, uh, that's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> we can just edit that out. Um, no, that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie for, for many reasons. I think that one of the best uh, parts of the movie for me was the dichotomy between the, the father and the mother in this movie. And so I've always had a weird um, sort of fascination with the superpowers that come from great loss and great pain. I think that everyone has inside them sort of a a superhero version of themselves that allows people to get through things like that. Some people get through it by shutting everything off and just getting through, and, and the father's whole deal is um, he will uh, um, uh, limit himself from any joy or happiness as long as it means that he can get his kids to bed at night. And Emily's whole character feel is that's surviving, and I don't want to survive, I want to thrive. I, I need to be a human being. We need to let our kids be real human beings, and so that's why the the barn is decorated like it is and sort of has a warmth to it and that's why she's homeschooling and things like that. So that was always one of my favorite scenes for that reason. But the other cool reason was people ask, you know, did you always know that, you know, it would, <laughs> the whole no sound, no dialogue thing would work? And I think it was day six or seven we shot that scene and I was standing behind the monitor with a producer and I was really nervous and, and that was the first scene that we were doing with sign language and as you can see, Yes, Emily was amazing in the scene, but Noah was incredible. This little boy was able to access this emotion that was so raw, so pure, and was just beaming off of his face. I could, I could not only feel everything he was saying, I was feeling for him, and I just thought, wow, this, I turned to my producer and I was like, this might actually work, and I was tearing up. And he said, hey man, it's day six. <laughs> it is way too late to be thinking this is gonna work. <laughs> like, we are way down the line. So that was my other reason for loving that. Uh, <laughs> um, what, what did you learn about your wife working so closely with her? Um, a whole hell of a lot, actually. I think that the weird thing is, is um, I had never thought of this, but we both do the same job, and yet we never get to see each other do it. We're sort of... This business is very island-like. You sort of go and do a movie, and it's like being on an island, and you come back. Um, so we had never been on a set together. We had never experienced a set together, the same crew, the same people, the same vibe. Um, I remember the week before we started shooting, I went in to uh, find an editing bay here in New York, and, and I was looking at this place, and downstairs uh, was Rob Marshall, who was editing said indie movie, Mary Poppins. And, um, he said, when do you guys start? And I said, next week. And he said, you're going to see. And I said, no, I know. I, I love her so much. And he said, nope, you'll see. 
And I said, I know, I'm her, I'm her biggest fan. He said, no, not until you're in the room when she does what she does will you know why she is such a great actress. And I thought, wow, what an incredibly amazing thing to say. Um, and then I think, I don't know, I guess it was day three or four, we jumped right into the bathtub scene. And she'll never tell you this because she's too humble, but that bathtub scene was one take. So her whole explosive performance was one take, so much so that afterwards you can hear me saying, that's lunch? Because I don't know where you go after that. <laughs> and he was right. I mean, something went through the room. All the air left the room. The crew couldn't speak. No one could move until I called that's lunch because something changed. And I had never seen a performance that was that powerful, that um, specific, dealing with fear, pregnancy, all these different things all, all at once. And, um, and then after I did say that's lunch, she, she immediately stops crying and goes, yeah, what is for lunch? I heard it's fajitas. Is it fajitas? <laughs> and I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> what? So um, I learned that she's a, you know, she's a, she's a certified genius. She's, she's as good as it gets. Um, one of the plot points that's generated a lot of discussion is the fact that Emily's character uh, gets pregnant in the movie and um, the family decides to have um, the child. Um, you know, people have read all sorts of things into this. Mm -hmm. I saw... Um, a, um, an editorial that uh, said that the film had a pro-life message. Mm -hmm. um, for you, what does it mean to you um, that, that Lee and Evelyn decide to um, bring a child into a broken world? Well, I mean, for starters, I don't think there's any greater compliment of anything you can do in an artistic medium um, than something that starts a conversation. Um, and I would never deny anybody to see their version of what they think of the movie or the scenes or whatever. Um, I think that's such an awesome uh, thing, and so for that, I'm, I'm really moved. As far as what I was thinking, um, again, it's one of those things where I always saw it as um, Emily's sort of steadfast claim to thriving instead of surviving. So that whole thing I was talking about before, that it would be the extreme of her saying um, that there's a candle of hope, that, that, that if we had a child, and yes, this seems like, you know, it really is all those old adages that you've heard that it's always darkest before the dawn and I think Emily always feels, Emily's character always feels that, that, that there is a dawn coming and she won't give up and so that baby represents we can be more, we can keep going and, and as a population, as a people, as a family we can keep going and that always moved me. I also think that, you know, not to get too, <laughs> too uh, um, uh, intimate with the whole thing but it's like I also love the idea that there's still people that they still were intimate together and things happen and there are facts that you have to face that, that just like any new parent that finds out they're having a child, that idea of, oh my God, I didn't know that was happening is happening to them and this, this sort of comes from it. Um, I, I don't know, I, it, to me it was just a beacon of hope that, that I always uh, saw it as. Mm. Um, I just wanna go back a little bit to your um, early career. Before you got the office, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you lived in New York and you were working as a waiter and, and trying out for things. Would you just talk a little bit about that time? I mean, was it um, a frustrating time? Was it a fun time? Uh... It was amazing. I mean, um, you know, retrospect, I think, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. but it was, to me, it was amazing because I knew what I was a part of. I, I went into moving to New York and being trying to give acting a shot with a timer on it. I had gone to a theater school after I graduated Brown University and went straight to a theater school. And after that theater school, which is one semester, it was 16 weeks or something at the National Theater Institute in, in um, Waterford, Connecticut. That changed my life. It, 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 it not only taught me what being an actor was, I actually went there out of pure laziness. I literally just needed semester credits to transfer back to Brown because I was a mid-year at Brown, so I still had a semester to make up, and I just thought, hey, this, this school will transfer credits back. And instead, I realized they weren't teaching you how to act, they were teaching you how to be. They were teaching you how to respect the idea of what you're doing and respect the circus that you are so fortunate to join. And so I always look at it as a circus of people that this community is, a blessing, to be able to do what you love is a blessing. And so that's sort of where I, what I took from that theater school. And I told my mom, she picked me up from that theater school and we hadn't left the driveway. And I said, I'm gonna move to New York and, and be an actor. And she hesitated for, I mean, 0.2 seconds. And she just said, fine, that's great. Just promise me one thing that when you get there, if you don't feel like you have, we used to fish as kids, if you don't have 
a bite or a nibble or anything like that. You, you got to pull yourself out because the only thing that you can't ask a mother to do is tell her kid to give up on his dream. So just don't put me in that position. I thought that was profound and really moving. So sure enough, you know, two and a half years in, that's my point is I was, I was going all in for these two and a half, three years. So I was sleeping on couches. I was barely paying cell phone bills. I was choosing between electric and cell phone bill. And it was all kind of very romantic because I knew I had an out if it didn't work out. I was, or at least I was going to try something else. But there is that very bohemian, very 1960s vibe, at least what I always heard, you know, that idea of rolling with a bunch of people who are also doing what you're doing and struggling and everybody knows where the dollar beer nights are because it's all you can afford. Um, you're, you're sleeping on each other's couches. You, you become the tightest and closest of friends. And so it was a really perfect time for me because I actually learned more about myself as a person than I did as myself as an actor or anything like that. And then after two and a half years, I called my mom and I said, nothing happened, had a really great bohemian lifestyle and it didn't work out. And so I'm, I'm gonna come home. And I was planning on coming home probably the next day. And she said, oh, it's, so, it's September, just, just wait till the end of the year, we'll talk about it at Christmas. And um, three weeks later, I booked the office. So, <laughs> yeah. So I give my mom 10%, she's fine. <laughs> she's fine. Uh, but no, I mean, it, it changed my life, her confidence in me and, and, and that belief system of keep trying and, and, and it, it, you know, listen, I'm, liter I'm living a lottery ticket life, I've always said that, and I really believe that, that people come up to me on the street and say, my kid's trying to be an actor, any advice? And I said, I can't give you advice on how to win the lottery, but what I can tell you is love it, love it, love it, and if you wake up any morning and you're like, I don't know if I love it enough to not be able to pay my cell phone bill, then, then you should walk away, and there's no... There's nothing wrong with that. I was gonna walk away. I know many people have walked away. As long as you get in there and you love what you do, especially these days where so many people are creating things. People say, how do I become a writer or a director? And I always say, it's, it's the love of the game. If you have something you love now more than ever, people don't know what everybody wants. The studios don't know what people want. They think they know and they'll try to find out and I'm sure they'd agree with me that if you have an idea like this movie, which is, I mean, in the pitch, that's got to be one of the craziest things to say yes to I've ever heard. But if you believe in it and you love it, people will actually pay attention because I think nowadays people are feeling the love of projects and the dedication behind them rather than just the successes of them and just what you're telling them to feel. So I, I think it's a, it's a really cool time. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, failure and struggle in, in the arts is difficult. I um, love how you went straight to failure after that. <laughs> but, but, uh, but so is success. You know, mm -hmm. Suddenly you have all these opportunities and you have to manage them. Um, I, you know, I think you've done that very well. Thank you. um, you've said that um, you took all the money that you made from the office pilot and then bought the rights to the David Foster Wallace book, which became your first mm -hmm. um, you know, um, feature as a director. Um, how did you, when things started to come to you after the office, how did you decide what you were going to say yes to, what you were going to pass up? Because when you're hungry, as an actor, I'm sure it all looks good. Yeah. You know? I mean, the, the truth is, is you know, I, I've been asked many times, you know, a lot of the stuff you're doing after the office, it seems like you're running away from gym. And I would tell you, it is the exact opposite. In fact, when I am at the end of this career, I, I know that the thing I'll be most known for is Jim, and that is an honor. That is an absolute thing that I'm looking forward to, and I can't, absolutely. That part not only changed my life, but it gave me every single opportunity I have, including being on this stage tonight. So it's one of those things where, I, like I said, I, I won this lottery ticket life, and I, I don't know what it was, but ever since I was a kid, I was very over-analytical, and, and I thought, I don't deserve this. I truly felt like I didn't deserve it. And so I named my company, my, the, the, the women who run my company right now are here, I think. Alexa and Allison are here, but they, they run my company. It's called Sunday Night, and the reason why I called it Sunday Night was because during those two and a half years in New York, the only thing you're not able to do when you're a working actor, writer, or director is act, write, or direct, because you're usually waiting tables, or for me, I was waiting tables and like cleaning out a yoga studio, or <laughs> whatever it takes, and so we would meet every single Sunday night, and that was the only opportunity we had to talk about our favorite play, our favorite movie, our favorite album, our favorite book, and it became this really artistic, fiery night where we would slam down the beer glasses and say, if we ever got the chance, this is what we'd do. 
Well, I got that chance, and I just felt I had to look back on those nights and give it a shot. I had to be what I said I would be, rather than just sort of be um, relax into sort of a, a laziness of just waiting to have the phone ring. And so I wanted to push myself, and I wanted to scare myself, and so I started doing these things. I did brief interviews with hideous men. I did this movie, 13 Hours, where you know um, I was you know playing a soldier and physically changing what I looked like and all these different things, and it was so much fun to try it. And I, and I was always saying, my, my line was, just put me in the game. If I screw up, don't ever put me in again, but just allow me to play the game and, and see if I can do it. And, and so that's what it, it's all about for me, is I've, I've had this tremendous opportunity, and the things that you're seeing, especially this movie, is me just trying to uh, feel like I deserve it. And, and what, how did you know to say no to something? How, what was your criteria for that? Well, it was, it was one of those things where, if I'm honest, after the, after the office, I remember a big producer came to me just before we ended, and he said, oh, man, wait, wait till the show's over. You won't believe it. The phone's going to ring off the hook. And I thought, really? Wow. And he said, yeah, that show's so big, you'll, you'll get all these jobs. And the phone never rang. I mean, that's the truth. It just didn't. Um, there was a long time where it didn't ring. And I understood why. I've always been a realist. I understand that when you play a part for so long, it's hard for people to see you in another light. And I get that. I wasn't angry about it. I wasn't mad about it. And, and the people who couldn't see you in that were directors and producers who were making other projects. And so that's why I started directing. I started, I wrote and, or I did not write, sorry. I, I wrote and directed brief interviews and I um, directed an incredible script by Jim Strauss called The Hollers. And that was my first real job back after the, after the office. And again, it changed my life. I, it, it was just one of those things where I was in the deep end. I was doing a, a movie that I thought was, you know, astonishingly huge and it was only like five million dollars or something or less than that and Margot Martindale and Richard Jenkins and Charlotte Copley and Anna Kendrick all these people were in it and I just felt wow I am I am really in it now if I if I don't know what I'm doing it's it's gonna be a, a bummer and it turned out to be one of the greatest experiences of my life and then I always knew that I wanted to write and direct again and so that's where where this one came in and how about now I'm sure the phone is ringing now <laughs> it is. You called me yesterday and offered me a very good piece. Um, no, it, it's one of those things where now certainly everything has changed. I mean, this movie has not only changed my career, it's, it's changed my life. It, I feel, you know, I told the story, I don't know if, if it means anything, but it meant something to me, is the, the Monday after uh, South by Southwest, which was a life-changing moment, which is, I, I had just finished the movie hours before. We were, we were editing the movie and sound mixing the movie probably uh, till 5.30 in the morning. And that's the night we were supposed to be in Austin, Texas, uh, premiering the movie. And so when I brought it there, I always say that the, the analogy would be that if, it, if I was presenting a painting, when I pulled the curtain off, paint would just be running off. It was just too fresh. And so I was so scared. And that reaction from South by Southwest was so major um, and I'll never forget looking over at my wife and people jumped out of their chairs and were shaking their chairs and I could just see my wife saying, oh my God, but I couldn't hear her, which was fitting <laughs> um, <laughs> because it was so loud. And so my wife is just like, oh my God. And I blacked out. I, I just, I didn't know what to, to feel or think or anything. I was just so moved by that reaction. And so the, the Monday I went home and walked my daughter to, to school again. And for the first time, I said to my wife, I said, she's walking to school with her whole father for the first time. And I don't even know why. There was something that this movie did. It satiated something. It allowed me to go out on a huge limb, write about the things that I really care about, the way I want to say them. And it just changed everything. I just feel so incredibly uh, lucky, but also so settled. And so to your point now, long answer, um, when people offer certain things, it's, it's a lot easier to see them for what they are, whether they're good or bad, or whether they work or not for me, which is really, at the end of the day, all that matters is, I, I, I could say no to a movie that will guarantee make $3 billion and win every single award, but it's not for me. The one thing I've always been is a huge fan of directing. And so even with this movie, any movie that I direct, it's gotta be because I know that I am the only person who can do it this way. Um, otherwise, you got to call David Fincher, you got to call Gus Van Sant, you got to call J.J. Abrams, you got to call these people that I so admire because they're such incredible talents. And so, if I can't do it as well as they can or in my own way, I, I, I just hand it off. 
And you're you're writing a sequel to A Quiet Place. I am right now. Yes. And, and yes. Um, Thank you. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. And, and, you know, you had the the advantage of coming out of the blue the first with the first film. Yeah. Um, how, so it's how, all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Uh, so how, how is it going and what are the challenges? Uh... Well, you know, um, I've said this before, but I, I didn't see this as a, we certainly didn't make the movie to be a sequel. Um, we, it was always supposed to be a one-off movie. It's a one-off story. <clears throat> but again, I'm a realist. I understand that when the studio has a hit on their hands, they want to make another movie. And so I said, great, go, go do that. And I totally get it. Um, and so they said, you know, I said, go write other, or meet other writers and directors. And they did. And while they were meeting these people, they said, do you have any ideas that we can just like pitch them? And I said, yeah, I mean, I had this tiny idea, but it, it, you know, I haven't really thought about it. And they said, well, while we're meeting all these people, can you keep thinking about it? <laughs> and it was this thing where they basically Jedi mind tricked me into <clears throat> writing the sequel. But what it was to me is, unlike most movies, certainly most sequels, I, I always see most sequels are about a hero or a villain that is beloved, and you have to create a world around them to put them back in that world. Well, we have the exact opposite. We have this beautiful world and these circumstances that a lot of different people and places could be living in or how they live or, or how people react. <coughs> and so I just thought there's a lot of interesting ways to expand the world and, and get to see and shine some lights on other parts of the world and, and other things that are going on. Um, so, so it, was, it was an idea that I, I started to sort of become obsessed with, and then I knew what my core story was, that little, that little idea I had, and so I just started sort of putting them together, and we'll see what happens. If it's any good, maybe we'll shoot it. <laughs> um, you seem to be entering a new phase of your acting career, um, the, the beard. Does that mean I'm getting old? <laughs> no, it's... And then you said the beard. It's, it's the bearded stud phase. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that. And, and uh, you know, I mean, you're, you you doing action uh, now, Jack Ryan on mm -hmm. Amazon. Um, you physically transformed. Thank you. Thank you. You were on the cover of Men's Health, which they don't let you on the cover of Men's Health. Unless, unless you, you pay them. Pack. <laughs> unless you pay them, yeah. Uh, what, <coughs> talk, can you talk a little bit about that transform, that physical transformation <coughs> and, and, you know, doing action? And, you know, did you see yourself as an action guy? Did it take... Um, I always thought that like there, there were, I always, I love action movies and I love all the superhero movies. Um, it was one of those things where, again, I felt like if I was right for the part, um, I'd love to give it a whirl. And so I was up for the part of Captain America. Um, I'm sure you've heard the story, I've told the story, but um, I was up for the part of Captain America <clears throat> and I was really excited about it. And I was putting on the suit. I got so far that they brought me on stage and I put on the suit. I'm probably gonna get like a dart in the neck. Marvel's like, stop talking. <laughs> um, but I was on the stage and I was putting on the Captain America suit. This is a true story. This is, this is real insecurity. Um, putting on the suit being like, I feel, I feel pretty good. I mean, I hadn't really worked out. I mean, on The Office, I'm not a jacked dude. <laughs> <clears throat> but I felt like, yeah, I gave it a good week and a half. So I'm ready. <laughs> And as I'm putting on the suit, um, Chris Hemsworth walked by as Thor. <laughs> and he was like, you all right, mate? And I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, nope, nope. And so then my agent called like a couple weeks later, and they, they said, you know, I'm really sorry. Uh, they're giving it to Chris Evans. And I went, yeah. <laughs> Look at him. He is Captain America. Um, so when 13 Hours came around, it was one of those things where I come from a big military family. I have 11 aunts and uncles and cousins who have served or are currently serving, which I you know, found is a big no Thank you, yeah, to them. And that was a big part of my life. I mean, we were, when we were kids, we, we would play at West Point. We would you know, go to different bases. We, we, would, we would be with our family. We would know when anybody was deploying. So it was a big part of our family. And I always said, if I could just you know, <clears throat> play a fraction of a part that would sort of reflect um, any version uh, or element of the heroism that, that, that they'd gone through, that would be my honor. And so when 13 Hours came around and it was a true story and I actually got to meet the real guys, it was a no-brainer for me. I had to audition for it and, and I auditioned for it and got it, which was really fantastic. But that, that movie changed a lot of things for me. Certainly physically, 
getting in shape, unlike the week and a half for the Captain America thing, <laughs> it was like an eight month deal where, yeah, it was like two, a day. It, it, it's, it's weird, you, you're not, I got in shape pretty quickly, but then like changing all the inside workings of your body took a long time and a lot of pain. But once you did that, it, it, it's sort of a lot easier to maintain rather than getting to the mountaintop the first time. So that movie, more than just physically transformed me, it really changed my idea of how that storytelling mechanism works. And one of the greatest experiences of my career has been that movie getting to um, interact more and be a part of the military community more. So I, you know, I'm, I'm working with a lot of incredible people in different outreach places, and I, I never miss an opportunity to try to um, be a part of any type of USO thing I can. So it's one of those things where that whole input is what changed the most out of 13 hours for me. And so then going to Jack Ryan, as much as that's sort of like an action part, I always saw it as weirdly the most fitting character that I could play because it was one of those characters that growing up as a kid, I thought, wow, anybody can be Jack Ryan, whereas not anybody can be Iron Man or Thor or any of these people because they're, they're not real human beings. Well, technically, Tony Stark is. I'm sorry. <laughs> Robert, I'm sorry. I, I made a mistake. Um, but it was one of those things, and, and, and what I admired most about the character was that he was not only a real guy, um, but there was secretly a, a, a real yearning for me to do what I did in 13 hours, which is portray uh, real-life heroes. And so getting to interact with everybody at the CIA is a whole new learning experience of of what that really means. People are putting their lives on the line in a whole different way, and yet just as uh, heroically and, and you know, on the front lines of our country for people that they've never met and never will met, meet, that to me there's nothing more heroic uh, that you can do. Um, I want to ask one, one more question, then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask uh, about your Oh my god, I thought you were inviting someone on stage, and you were like, and your sixth grade teacher. And I was like, what? This fits you? <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about your reaction shots from The Office, um, which, which may out- The hard-hitting question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, great. Um, which may outlive Great. you on the internet. Um, so this is a website, Giphy. Uh, according to this website, there are over 15,000 memes of Jim from The Office. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, if you type that in. Um, I Should wondered, we be clapping? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, have you ever texted your own meme to somebody? Have you ever done, texted the reaction chat to somebody? I have definitely gotten myself <laughs> texted to You me. have? Yes. Which is very meta and sort of, <laughs> sort of throws you into a vortex. Um, no, I've never texted my own meme. And, and do, you, have you ever, do you ever bust out those looks in real life with your family? <laughs> All or? the time. <laughs> Um, no, I never do, though it's funny because I can see it sometimes in my kids, where you'll say like, hey, it's bath time, and they go, you have it. The gym is strong within you. Um, yeah, but no, I, no, I don't. Okay. Um, so we're going to take questions. Someone's walking around with a microphone. Uh, just keep it brief. And no, no hugs. Wow, that's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, hey, how about down here in the front? You want to... Hi, hi, John. Hi. Oh, thanks. You want to wait a second? Wait for the microphone. That's coming. Please, there's a protocol. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like I was saying, I'm a huge fan of yours, and especially you. The Office. I Thank watch you. it every day. It's becoming unhealthy. Nice. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of like fan theories online about certain things in the office. Oh God. And my question for you is, is Toby the Scranton Strangler? <laughs> it's a great question. I'm gonna answer it here today. Turn off the cameras. <laughs> um, I can't give that away, but what's your theory? Uh, it seems like he is. All right, I'll go with that. <laughs> Thank you, big, big fan. I love everybody like, <gasps> It's going to be after today. Um, how about here with the gray scarf? Yeah. It's winter. Everybody has a gray scarf. Is it, wait, is it? Oh, is it? Ooh, really challenging the microphone. <laughs> Hi, 
I'm wondering, during the writing process for A Quiet Place, if you shared drafts with Emily, or if you had to keep her at an arm's distance since she was so integral to the movie. I always try to keep Emily at an arm's distance. <laughs> uh, it's the way to make a relationship work. What? <laughs> Let's cut that out. Um, no, uh, bizarrely, I uh, didn't ask Emily to be in the movie. I wrote the part exactly for her. She was the only person I wanted. Like I said, she was doing an indie movie called Mary Poppins, and she had just had our second daughter. Um, so she had a lot going on. But I, I wrote it for her knowing that she would absolutely be the best for the role. Um, certainly not only for the character, but also she was the only person I saw that defined sort of strength in, in feminism and also childbirth, things that I had witnessed for myself, which I hadn't <laughs> witnessed a lot um, other than her. Um, but what happened was uh, she actually asked to read the final draft, or, or the draft that we were going to go shoot with, because I was going to pitch it to Paramount. And she said, uh, can I read it? And I said, sure. And I was actually moving down the line with a friend of hers who she had recommended. And she read it on the plane and turned gray. Uh, I thought she was sick. <laughs> and I turned, truly was reaching for a barf bag. And she said, um, you can't let anyone do this movie, which is kind of like a riddle. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> You're not supposed to make the movie? And then she said, uh, will you let me play this role? And I totally teared up. I cried everything. Don't worry. It's not a big deal. Um, I totally teared up and screamed yes. And it was one of the greatest moments in my career because I knew I, I, I couldn't. I was afraid that she would say no, but I was more afraid that she would say, yes, I'll do it for you, um, which she is generous in spirit enough to do that. And I had been sitting next to her every single um, script she signed on to. And I can see the dedication and the immediacy of her taste level and class level. So I didn't want to be the first guy where she was like, yeah, I'll do it. But <laughs> you know, I only did it for my husband, so that's why I didn't ask her, so I was really lucky that she, so she, the first draft she read was the one that was pretty close to shooting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm also, gonna... I don't need her notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a question from Facebook. This is uh, from Cara Ortiz. Um, she asks, what do you think of the comparisons between your film and Bird Box on Netflix? Oh, um, I haven't seen Bird Box yet. I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, I think that I'm a huge fan of Sandra Bullock's. I'm, uh, it looks really interesting. I, I actually have only seen a couple of those comparisons, but I can't wait to see it. Um, can we take uh, a question from the back? Uh, uh, how about over here? There's one hand up over here. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Hi. Um, my husband and I are huge fans of Harley from It's Complicated. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great movie. Love that movie. You didn't expect that. I'm you sorry. My brain the... just exploded. <laughs> Keep going. Um, we wanted to know if um, the, the bathroom scene, the pot smoking in the yes. guest bathroom, um, if uh, any of that was ad-libbed with like you and Meryl. And the Alec entire Baldwin. thing was ad-libbed. It was uh, one of the greatest moments of my life because I... I'm a huge Alec Baldwin fan. I'm a huge Merrill fan. Funny couple quick anecdotes about that. So the first scene I ever did with Merrill, Merrill had worked with Emily. Um, and I was wait. I think I was behind a door. The first scene we were doing, she was coming into our apartment, which was like, you know, the nicest apartment I've ever been in. Um, <laughs> and she was coming in, and I opened the door. And just before the scene, I said, just so you know, when I open the door, I'm going to be shirtless. And she was like, then you're going to want to do some push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, damn, Meryl Streep. So that started our relationship there. And um, Alec was always so nice and so generous. But when we were doing that scene, it was just we were doing the scene. And then I'd ad-lib something. And Nancy Myers would come out and say, that was really funny. Do something else. And Alec was like, I'm going to get in on that. And started joking. We were one-lining each other. And then, I came in, and totally unbeknownst to me, um, Alec said, I'm going to shotgun in your mouth, and turned it around. And like, that's real. Just like bare paw hands slowly <laughs> moving my head to his. And I was like, oh my god. Like, that all happened. And if you watch the movie again, you can see I am definitely starting to break slash scream for my life. It was, <laughs> But that was one of the funniest moments uh, uh, I've ever been a part of, because that was just um, one of the boldest improvs ever. 
I was assaulted, is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It, the the, the uh, young man in the back there. Yeah. They're like, we're all young men in the back. <laughs> How dare you? Hi. So uh, what was your favorite prank on Dwight in the office? Good question. There's a bunch of them. Um, the writers were so unbelievable on that show. And to be honest, it was one of the things that when we got a new script and just before the table read started, I was like, oh my god, what's the prank? Um, there are a lot of them. I, I, weirdly, I have a weird favorite one, which is the nickels in the he handset. <laughs> That's my favorite one. Just because it's so demented. That's like so nefarious and like horrible. It's so overthought. <laughs> um, and then second to that, just because the scenes were so funny um, of uh, uh, putting all his stuff in the vending machine. <laughs> just because I remember shooting those scenes where <laughs> Jenna and I had those coins and I was like, E1? <laughs> and it was like, that's my stapler or whatever. It was, <laughs> it was the, that, that was the joke that kept on giving. That was the joke. Uh, I'm gonna do another uh, Facebook. This is Gene from Facebook. Um, how do you direct children and adult actors differently? That's a really good question. So I had always heard never work with children because they, no truly, because they never know their lines, it's so hard to get them to deliver a performance. Um, also, they have to go to school. Uh, <laughs> and so there's all these things that were like, by the time you get to the end of your day, they've wasted so much time. I got so lucky because these two kids, I probably wasted their time because these, these kids were not only two of the best actors I had ever worked with, um, they were two of the greatest humans I had ever met. They were so beautiful in the way they thought, the way they held themselves. Their parents were unbelievably kind and wonderful people, which is sometimes rare on sets. And um, the, the, for me, it was hard to direct these kids because we didn't have dialogue and things. So what we started doing was having, to be honest, like small doses of psychoanalysis. We would talk to each other in very deep ways about what we thought of our parents, what we thought of um, uh, loss. Uh, have you ever experienced loss? Like really dark, big things. And these kids, I remember there was the scene, um, one of the first things I shot with Millie, who is genuinely not from this planet. I guarantee you we're all gonna find out that she was a, a, a bona fide angel and we were just lucky to spend time with her. I promise you that. Um, so we were doing the scene where she walks across the bridge alone. And I was trying to explain to her, this is why you're looking so tough and you're frustrated and your dad and all these different crazy um, technical things. And she was just looking at me. I wouldn't say placating, <laughs> but she was kind of looking at me nodding. And I said, do you, do you have a question? And she said, no, I know what to do. And I said, okay. And she just did it in the first take. And everything I had imagined in that part came across in the first take, the first time she walked across that bridge. And I was like, great, so that job is done. <laughs> um, and that's how it was the whole time. As far as getting to know these kids, the other cool thing was when you're an actor, a lot of times if you're like dating someone in a movie, they're like, just go to TGI Fridays and fall in love. <laughs> and you're like, what? Um, but that's what they do. You just kind of try to go out with people for two or three nights before you start shooting. And what I realized was that would probably not be great for these kids. So I had them and their entire families come to our house. And I thought the only thing I can do is be the most honest I can and let them see how I am as a father and how I am with my kids. And I got to witness how they are with their parents and how they conversed. And I'm telling you, specific things in the movie, bigger ideas in the movie all changed once I saw how they interacted with their parents and how respectful they were, how beautiful they were, and what made them frustrated, things like that. So we actually learned a lot about each other um, from watching uh, each other interact. But the, the biggest one is, um, Millie was signing to her mother, and one of the things she signed was always. And I said, wait, wait, wait what, what was that? And she said, this is always. And I said, oh, can you say, um, I have always loved you? And she did it. And as she did it, I immediately started to tear up. And Emily was on the couch here, and she goes, that's going in the movie. <laughs> and so that whole, that, whole, um, that whole moment in the movie is because I watched uh, Millie talking to her mom. Uh, how about over here? Um, uh, and a striped shirt here. I never will remember what I'm wearing, so I'd be like, Emma's <laughs> striped shirt? Um, 
it's very apparent that uh, family is important to you. Yes. The conversation from the impact on the film. Uh, my wife and I are actually expecting our first kid this year. Yes. Summer. Woo! Thank you. Uh, so do you have any uh, advice as, as a <laughs> fa future father? Spend the money on the bathtub, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, my, my, my best advice would be um, listen, but don't take anybody's advice. Just li do, do it for yourself. Everybody here is a child of somebody, and we all got through, and people have had kids, they all got through. I think that what I would strongly suggest is don't be too hard on yourselves. Everything's gonna be tough and change and shift, and everything moves and shakes, and if you spend too much time thinking about, like, what's the best way to do this diaper? Just get the diaper on. The, the, the kid's gonna be fine. Like, it, the, the two things that matter are, are love and, and you being present around them all the time. So that's it. Uh, up, way up front here. In the Bears Beats Valsar Galactica shirt. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, yes! <laughs> Thanks for having rain on your cell phone. <laughs> oh. So uh, I watched a video earlier this week with you and Emily, and you were saying that you were originally going to be an English teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so was going to into theater, like the school that you went to, is that would really like set you off into becoming an actor or wanting to become an actor? Or did 100%. you want in your early So uh, again, it, it is the community that I fell in love with, the, the, the people that I fell in love with. I certainly had no ambition to be a successful actor. I just wanted to be an actor because of the people around me. So. Again, I went to Brown University, which is a really great school. I got a great education, but for me, the real education was these people that I met. So as soon as I got into the theater arena, and by the way, I, I wasn't even, I was like arm guard number four in all the plays. Like I barely, I had no presence there. But I, I got to l meet everybody and like paint sets and light lights. And um, it was those people I asked, give me a movie and an album that I should have, that I should know about. Up until I got to school, I'd never really seen anything that wasn't in a cineplex. I'd never listened to music that wasn't on the radio. And so these kids were the smartest, most informed, sort of voracious livers of life that I, I just wanted to be around them more. And that, that community was always flowing with energy and ideas. And so seven or eight of my friends did that. For four years, they gave me a new album and a new movie and it changed my entire life. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know what my artistic identity was. I wouldn't know what I thought was cool. I wouldn't know what I didn't think was cool. I wouldn't know about risk taking if it wasn't for these guys and girls trying to really show me a crash course in, in, in what's beautiful about what we do. And so it's really the community that I fell in love with and the community that I keep trying to remember. That's, like I said, you know, doing something like this, now that I have some opportunity to choose a little bit more, I, I think that the greatest compliment I can pay all the people that got me here is to do something that is worthy of them and, and worthy of their ideas and, and the cool stuff that we all sort of talked about back then. And you want to pass the mic to your, to your friend? Pass the mic, y'all. Um, I read somewhere that the girl who played the oldest daughter in the movie is deaf in real life. She is, yeah. How did you um, translate using sign on screen and off screen, like between everybody that Great was in question. the movie? Great question. So um, Millie is, uh, Millicent is, is her name, we call her Millie, and, and she's one of those people, we learned ASL for the scenes and for, you know, as much as we could for interacting, but it was sort of a crash course, it was really hard to do. And then Millie came on set and we met her and everything changed. We started, first of all, Noah was speaking fluent uh, ASL, I'm not kidding, in two weeks. I mean, he was just, he wouldn't allow for the interpreter to be around, he just wanted to talk to her directly. They are now consequently such good friends that I promise you the saddest part about this movie is when we wrapped. Like, they were sort of up on a little bit of a hill and the entire crew was like, don't look, don't look. And you saw these two little withered silhouettes like hugging each other and crying. So, yes, yes, for the beauty of children. Um, but what, what I mean by what happened that changed is she had such a presence about her that allowed you, like a great teacher, it allowed you to want to be better, it made you want to learn every little nuance rather than just sort of slam your way through it. And um, how it worked is she would have an interpreter on set all the time who was amazing. And uh, the interpreter would stand next to me 
and I would talk directly to Millie. I would never look at the interpreter. You'd just talk to her and, and address her and give her all the notes. And she would look at you, she would look at me um, the entire time. And what was so amazing is she would very rarely look over at the interpreter because she always said, I know exactly what he's saying. I'm just looking at the interpreter to make sure. I'm just making sure I don't lose anything in translation. One of my favorite moments was at South by Southwest, my, ma my mom r ran over to meet her and my mom was very emotional and was starting to talk to Millie, not knowing that there was an interpreter or whatever, and the interpreter was running across the room to try to be there. And Millie put her hand up and said, no, I, I know everything this woman's trying to tell me and I'm so moved. And that just blew me away, just blew me away. Yeah, she's a very special individual. You should all meet her. She should, here she is. <laughs> no. That would be way cooler than me being out here, I promise. I think we have time for one last question. Whoever you want to hand the mic to. The guy in the winter clothes? <laughs> It's fine. Um. Hi. Um, I'm here. God? Oh. <laughs> yes, it's God. I've seen your film four times, and I'm. Wow. It's the smartest film I've Thank seen. Thank you this so year. much. Um, I've seen Did you it plant twice. her to be the last question? <laughs> That's the best. I have a 12 year old who's very into the genre, so I had to preview it first, then let him watch it. And then That's I a good saw parent. it twice on an airplane. Um, in on different flights, and and <laughs> I have to ask you about your process with sound editing and mixing, and how much that played a part in your process during filming. Honestly, because like the best is, question that the, this is amazing. It is such. <laughs> I hope you got forty-five minutes. It's so moving. It's so moving, and such a huge part of moving the story along. So, so the the thank you for all that, by the way. But thank the, you. The thank first you for thing I film. I said when I was doing when I sat down to rewrite the script, I knew that sound would be the main character, not a main character, the main character, and I knew that the um, presence of sound, um, sound mixing, sound editing, all those things. That's a great way to pitch a sound design team, is to say that sound is the main character in the film. I knew exactly who I wanted. These guys, Ethan and Eric, who are absolute geniuses. I don't call them sound designers, I call them sound magicians. They've done everything from uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan to Avatar to Terrence Malick movies. They, they've run the gamut. They know the importance of creating a world through sound. And so I wanted them, one of my favorite stories was I was pitching them in a theater just like this and they were sitting there and I said, so you know, sounds the main character and all these nice things that I thought. And they were going like this, they were jogging their leg and like rubbing their eye and like, <laughs> oh. and they looked so bored. And I turned to my producer like, we're never gonna get these guys. And I said, do we have a problem? And they said, uh, no man, we know exactly what this movie is, we just gotta go. You gotta let us go do it right now. <laughs> and I was like, okay, go. And they ran out of the theater. <laughs> And went to their office and started working on it right away. So there was, there was already this incredible <laughs> symbiotic relationship that we had. They, they, they were reading my mind and what it was. And then the coolest thing happened, which is we had all these ideas, we had all this design, the, the, the movie sounded great, and we started taking big, big swings. And, and what we both realized was, if you're gonna do a movie like this, do it all the way. Don't do it half-assed. And so. What I, what I mean by that is one of the greatest parts of this whole experience was, the, in the sound experience, was um, we had the idea, because on set, Millie was talking to her mom one day, and I remember that her mom, very much like in our film, she was speaking as she was signing. And I went up to the mother and I said, oh, can she hear, is that why you're speaking? And she said, no, she can't hear, it's just what I do, and I, you know, it's, that's my normal behavior, and so I present her my normal behavior. I said, what can she hear? And she said, she can't hear anything. She can't hear anything. She can maybe hear a low-level rumble, she calls it, like a low-level rumble. And if there was something behind her that crashed, maybe she could hear it, but she'd probably feel it first. So I went back to the sound team and I said, let's do that. Let's capture her world and let's try. And I'm sure we'll fail, but let's try. And so that was really late in the game. We decided to pull out all the sound anytime you're with Millie. And it was because of what her mother said. And so I did it to the T and then at South by Southwest, I said to her before we went into the theater, I said, hey, so here's the thing. I took a shot. If you have any problems with it or you have any notes or whatever, I still have a couple more days in the sound mix. Just let me know what you feel. Without a doubt, the most moving part of this entire process is when she came up to me sobbing, not crying, sobbing. And she said the entire, whew, I tear up every time. The, my, my entire life, the only thing I've wanted 
is to understand the experience of my daughter, and you just gave it to me. So yeah. So, so those guys are geniuses, is the whole point. Yeah. It's true. Um, well, thank you, John, for doing thank this. You. Thank you, guys. And this was thank awesome. Thank you for coming. Thank you, so much. thank you very much, sir. That was great. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody.